while it looks like I have totally misguided my demographics here with the young people of the old about my, 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 my uh, children, sir. Uh, we have a saying around our house. Ain't nobody got time for that, but I guess it all is all around our house. But anyway, uh, today we continue uh, our sermon series between a sinner and a saint. And since we started, we acknowledge that our walk of faith, that our relationship with Christ is not one that is constant. Because we live in a world that is broken, because there are times or seasons or circumstances where we feel separated from God, we realize that we are somewhere between a sinner and a saint. If someone approached me and said, you know, I'm not sure that I fit in the sinner thing. I don't, I don't, I don't, what is a sinner? And we're kind of great conversations that are kind of harsh when I use the word sinner. And I think that I need to stop and explain that the original word of sin actually is translated to miss. To miss. The root word means forgetfulness. It has nothing to do with, with what you do, actually. I mean, the whole thing is whether you're doing it with a by being conscious of it or out of an unconscious state. And we're all sinners because it truly means that sometimes we miss God. We get so wrapped up in our current situation that we miss God's presence, that we miss God's blessings that He bestows upon us, that we're so wrapped up that we're sinners or sin or miss or forget God's holy presence in our life. And even when times are good, we miss. That's what it means. And so we turn to Jesus' words today as he speaks about the end of the time. And when Jesus speaks about the end of the time, like last week, it doesn't mean about Armageddon. He's not talking about an end of, he's talking about an end of an era. The end of the old way of doing something. And actually, he's talking about the end of a religious system as the people had always known and practiced. Jesus is in the temple teaching after our free encounters with the religious leaders that we talked about last time. And the temple was the place where God touched the earth. It was the center of the Jewish world. It was stunning. It was beautiful beyond words. It was huge as the outer court where the people gathered to worship could hold over 400,000 people. Let that sink in at one time. Its beauty, its size, its importance is overwhelming to say the least. And our story this morning comes right after Jesus observes a poor widow giving her offering. If you will join with me in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the 5th verse. Some of his, Jesus' disciples, were remarking about how, how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when no one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be torn down. Before we go any further, what we need to understand was the temple was enormous. The temple was beautiful because of Herod, the Roman student who proclaimed himself to be king of the Jews. And he spent massive amount of money to make this temple beautiful. And Herod was vicious. He was brutal. He was known for the private slaughter of his entire family. <clears throat> and for his public generosity, he built this temple so that it would trump any comparison with the temples built by his rivals. They're pagan temples. And faithful Jews testified to God's unique mystery collaboration of, of this evil guy in this beautiful place. But they also knew that this beautiful case 
Restoration Project was also meant to bring glory to Herod himself, who was only a grandson of a convert to the Jewish faith. And all rabbis at, during that time didn't even acknowledge Herod as being a, a Jew. Because no one that brutal, no one that malware, no one that pagan and cruel could belong to the chosen family of God. So here Jesus talks about destroying the temple. And although his words have a, have a double life to it, you see, one, the destruction of the temple would remove Herod's legacy and the connection it has to the a, a Jewish faith forever. But on the other hand, the temple would be destroyed. The temple, even in Herod's corruption, was a place of holiness, was a place of honor and respect. So let us continue. We pick, continue the story. Teacher, the disciples ask, when will, these, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Jesus replied, Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, that the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and excuse me, of various places, and fearful events, and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought after kings and, and governors, and all on account of, of me and my name. And so you will bear testimony to me, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself. For I will give you words of wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by your parents, your brothers, and your sisters, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But, but not a hair of your head will perish. So stand firm, and you will win life. Again, Jesus is not talking about a checklist of things that will happen before we will know the world is going to end. Remember, this is not an end of time thing. Nor is Jesus, nor is it a commercial for Jesus is coming back here. Jesus is speaking about Christian endurance. He's saying, look, when your temples are destroyed, it's not the end. God is with you. He speaks about the truth of life. He says, Jesus says, even in a world where catastrophes are destroying everything, the saints, God's faithful people, will be the ones who will manage the strength to lift up their heads and expect a resurrection, lift up their heads and expect redemption. Those are the ones that will lift up their heads and expect rescue. It's saying, God, my world is truly falling apart here. And I don't know. I don't know, God, if I have the strength to face tomorrow. God, I am truly at the end of my road, but, but, but I know, I know, I know somehow, I know some way, I know through someone, God, you are not going to get, only get me through this, but you are going to make my life better than it was before. Better. And the beauty is, 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 is that when, when we as a faith family gather to, to worship each week and to, to sing songs and to hear bells of praise and, and to lift up our prayers to God and to, to hear God's word and, 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 and to be with one another, you know the beauty is that, that each week in our temple we are a collection of sinners and saints. I mean, we have people whose lives have been shattered. We have people sitting here this morning who hopes and dreams have been trampled on. We have people sitting here this morning feeling like it is the end of time. And we're reminded that every saint has a past and every sinner 
our economy and we see what's going on, when we turn on the news and see what's going on, it's tempting when we evaluate all our, our family problems. It's tempting when we look at our financial problems, when we factor in all this tempting. It's so tempting to think, you know, there's really nothing I can do. I mean, look, I mean, if, if the mountain's this high, I'm just a little old me. What, what can I do? I'm just one person. And the sinner in me wants to do nothing, but the saint in me is pulling me to do something radical to change the whole world or to change the whole thing. When that happens, I'm, I'm reminded of a story that, that my father told. It was about a farmer. And I must say, my dad wasn't a farmer. Although he dug up my mom's entire rose garden and backyard to play over one time. And it was, yeah, I wasn't too happy. So, so my mom found him a plot of land somewhere else in someone else's uh, farm. So he had a little garden. So my dad wasn't a farmer, he was a gardener, I guess. But he uh, told me the story of a, of, of a farmer that, that had, a, had a plot of land that needed to be cleared and plowed and so he sends his son out to clear and cultivate the land. And when the sun arrives, he sees all this overgrown weeds and he sees all these thorns and these huge bushes. And the son steps back and he evaluated the time that he had and figures, you know what, with the time that I had, there's no way I can clear all this in time to get seeds in the ground. It's impossible. So, so he begins and he, he clears it out just a small spot. And he lays down and he takes a nap. The next day he returns. And he notices that there's more weeds and there's, there's more bushes. And then again he evaluates the time that he has to, to get the seeds in the ground. There's no way he can clear all that, cultivate it, get it plowed in time for the seeds to be in the ground for a harvest. So he lays down in the same plot of grass that he cleared the first day, and he sleeps that day away. Each day was the same. He would come, he would evaluate, he would see the job at hand, and he would lay down and take a nap. The father, one day, upon checking on his son's progress, comes and, and finds his son laying there, and nothing had been cultivated. And the son jumps up and he says, look, I didn't have time to clear all that. It's time to get the seeds in the ground. It was just too much. <clears throat> the father replied, son, if you have just cleared the same amount of ground each day that you cleared the first day to lay down and take a, a, a nap, you would have been finished by now. Son, without the little things, there are no big changes. We live between a sinner and a saint. But we can't be focused only at the end of time. And I'm not sure how long it will take to, to cultivate the whole world. I don't know how long it will take to clear all the weeds and bushes out of our community. I don't know how long it will take to, to clear all the, all the past and the mess out of family relationships and, and financial problems. To be honest, I don't even know how long it will take to cultivate our faith family to grow to its fullest potential, even with God's grace. But I am sure. I am sure, however, that, that as we live between the sinner and the saint, I am sure that, that, that I, just little old me, will do whatever I can. I will share God's love and mercy and grace. I will do what I can to connect people to the love of Jesus Christ. I will let my little old life be a witness to the gospel, the good news and love and mercy that is found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And some days I will be close to a sinner Maybe on occasion I'll be close to a saint. But I can only do that if I am willing to accept the fact that the ground must be dug up locally one conversation at a time. 
It must be done one prayer at a time. It must be done one act of kindness at a time. It must be done one forgiveness at a time. It must be done one 